There we go. So I thought it might be useful tonight to talk a little bit about anxiety and ways that I find mindfulness incredibly useful um, in working with this challenging mind state. And I thought that, um, or hoped it would be timely as well. Uh, I certainly think we would all agree that there are very difficult aspects of American life currently and life around the globe, for sure. Um, maybe some people thought the pandemic was um, uh, lessening some, only to discover that we're at numbers that haven't been seen before. Um, certainly, we've all witnessed and perhaps been a part of uh, lots of civil unrest as more and more people become involved in protesting the unfair treatment of brown and black bodied Americans. Um, there's greater economic insecurity and uncertainty for so many more people now. And then there are just the ongoing anxieties that plague us humans most of the time. And those are the ones associated with having a body that ages having a body that gets sick, and having a body that eventually dies. So anxiety often is a part of many people's lives. In fact, I heard today on NPR, I can't remember what um, program I was listening to, but uh, they just did a recent survey uh, across our country and found that one in three Americans uh, described multiple symptoms of anxiety currently. That's pretty high. Um, so it's useful to have a way of working with this mind state when it arises. And one of the things that I think happens when we see uh, our stressors as the conditions in which uh, the conditions of our environment is what we get is we're guaranteed to continue to be stressed. If we see stress as out here instead of our reaction to it, we don't have um, a real locus of control. I don't like to use that word, but um, there's not a whole lot we can do. Uh, really to mitigate that when we see that it's out here. And one of the first realizations on this mindfulness journey is that the first place of intervention is always the mind, right? That's one of the first things that we discover, for example, in mindfulness-based stress reduction, that it matters how we're reacting to what's happening in the environment. And when we can shift that a little bit, things inevitably change. Our inner experience changes. And of course, that's not to say that we don't want to do our part in society to continue to improve the conditions for all living beings. That's critical. But when we try to intervene with anything from an anxious mind, often the outcome is radically different than when we intervene with a mind that's more balanced, more equanimous. I do think that one of our most difficult mind states is the anxious mind. You know, this mind full of dread or fear about some future happening, and it could be the future one second from now, the future a week from now, or a year from now, or at the time of our death. But it's all, anxiety is always future oriented. You know, and, and the thing that's so insidious about an anxious mind state is often it prohibits the person from having insight into seeing that the mind is anxious. And it manifests in so many different ways. And of course, it manifests as a mind-body complex. So 
When anxiety is present, many people feel irritation, anger, a shortened fuse, heightened reactivity, or an exaggerated startle response. And when anxiety becomes so high that it reaches the point of panic, often there's an experience of a shortness of breath and dizziness and that feeling of needing to run or flee. In all of these manifestations though, the body's energy is activated. And when we turn toward the body, we can sense that pretty quickly. We often feel tense and on edge. And if we check out this channel in the front, this throat, chest, and gut, often what we find is the, the sense of being wound tight. And in this mind state of fear and dread, interpersonal interactions become really challenging. You know, as the stress mechanism in the brain is activated, this openness turns to constriction. And this flexibility turns to rigidity. And that's a hard place to be in interpersonal interaction when that happens. So this is a mind state that first and foremost, mindfulness as we develop and cultivate this, we begin to see and know when the mind is anxious instead of just acting from this place in mm, uh, sort of autopilot, we actually began to know it as a mind state, different from other mind states that we also experience. And what we learn quickly is that when we are truly present, when we are grounded in the present moment, Anxiety can exist, that those two things are oxymoronic, they're incompatible. Because anxiety is a mind state associated with the future, the present moment eradicates it. But we have to remember <laughs> to come back to the present moment, right? That's one of the most challenging things about mindfulness is to remember that we can always come back to the present moment and practice that. So tonight, I want to just spend the rest of the time talking about working with anxiety. And I want to talk about it in two ways. First, I want to talk about how do we work with it when it's already arisen? It's kind of slipped past the gates, the sense gates, and now we're fully anxious. And then I want to talk about how to prevent the anxious mind from arising in the future. So in this moment of anxiety, when we stop and realize that anxiety is present, there's a way that I have historically worked with anxiety that I think of as sort of outside, inside, outside. It's this movement um, in keeping with the flow of, of how everything moves. So outside, what I mean by this is often it can be skillful before we turn directly toward the anxious mind-body complex to first get grounded in where we are in this present moment. So that's the outside. We tune into our senses to ground us. So perhaps first and foremost, we use that sense, that kinesthetic sense of connection. So feel the feet on the ground. Like literally stop and take a second to feel the, the felt sense of connection to the ground. And then Find something else that you can touch and feel the sensations of. Perhaps it's clothing. Perhaps it's the bark of a tree. 
and then find one more. So we find three things to touch. And then we shift to the next sense, the eyes, and we notice three things in the present moment, perhaps the blueness of the sky, perhaps the greenness of the grass. And then when we finish with the three things we can see, we move to the ears and perhaps close your eyes and really listen to the bird song, to the wind, to the hum of the air conditioning. And then open up your nose, smell, see if there are smells that you can identify. And even if you can't, it's still dropping into that olfactory sense. And then taste. Maybe you have eaten recently, maybe you haven't. But see what's in the mouth. Once you do that, go through the senses, identifying three things. It takes about a minute. And when anxiety isn't really high, it's sort of low on the continuum, often that's the end of it. You just sort of return to what's happening. But not always, right? Sometimes anxiety is, is more intense. And so it's still present in the body and we need to turn toward it. And this is when we go inside. We're grounded now in the present, but something's still nagging. And so we turn toward it. And many people are already have already experimented with RAIN. The acronym RAIN is recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. This is a, a very skillful way to work with any mind state, especially anxiety. And it was originally developed by a Dharma teacher, Michelle McDonald, but probably you may have heard it more from Tara Brock, who's really popularized it. It's been around for a long time and it's very useful. So first of all, we recognize what's in the body. Ah, oh, the throat is tight, the gut is churning. And the A is so important, the allow. Because what we do with an unconditioned mind is whenever anxiety arises, we try to get away from it. We try to distract, we try to push away, we try to do something different. It just doesn't work that well. So the A is the place where we shift from no, I don't want this, no, I'm not going to accept this. So yeah, this is already here and I can be with it. So yes, the allow is yes, it's here. It's not yes, I like it. Yes, I want more of it. It's just yes, it's here. It's right here. And then the I is the investigate. And this is our willingness to stay with it, to let it teach us what it needs. Often all it needs is loving awareness, a witnessing, a willingness just to breathe with the palpating heart, the tight gut. And we just stay with it. And inevitably it begins to change because that's the natural law of everything, not because we're forcing it, but because we've stopped forcing it and we're just with it. And the in which Tara Brock really changed from um, non-identification to nurturing, I think was a really good move because what it invites us into is the compassionate heart, just to be compassionate with ourselves. Whatever we're experiencing, lots and lots and lots of other humans have experienced also. This is the nature of being human. We get caught up in our head, we get fearful, we get worried, we know we can't control everything and instead of accepting that, we push against it and it creates great anxiety. This is our human condition and we can bring some compassionate awareness to that. 
And then we can move back out, connecting again to the greater world. And this isn't so much that first outside where we're being very particular at each senses. This time, it's kind of a whole body awareness and a connection to all other humans, a connection to the earth, and the feeling that this is part of it, it's okay. So with that, what's so important, you guys, is that we practice this. Having an intellectual understanding of this does nothing. When we can shift and see anxiety as an opportunity instead of a hindrance, we actually can use it to practice creating equanimity, to practice turning toward it, to practice watching how quickly it shifts. But we have to practice it each time we see it arise, to recognize it, to allow it, to be with it, to not be afraid of the fear. This is a practice. And it reaps great benefits when we have the discipline and the determination and the resolve to keep meeting it with this loving awareness. This is the tool of mindfulness. So let me now speak to how mindfulness helps us prevent anxious mind states from arising. We have some tools if we'll use them when anxiety is already here, it slipped past us. First of all, there's no quick fix. Our brains are definitely not iPhones. They're not computers. You know, brain change is neuroplasticity is very real and it takes time. But first of all, we have to be attentive to what we put in our minds. That's so important. How often is it useful to listen to the news? And at what point does that really only create greater anxiety and lack of control? Like, where is that line for each of us? It's so important if we want to cultivate what is known in Buddhist psychology as the beautiful mind states, these minds of generosity and loving kindness and compassion and balance. If we want these mind states, we have to be very aware of what comes in, how how much we take in and how we care for ourselves. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that our daily practice is our best friend in this way. One of the things that we know from neuroscience is that through a meditation practice, we really do rewire our nervous system. Where perhaps if we are extremely anxious, we sort of walk through our days with anxiety, our sympathetic nervous system is kind of chronically ramped up. If we just take 30 minutes a day to to focus on that connecting and calming breath, we strengthen the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our rest and digest system. And it's like putting money in the bank. We're shifting our nervous system. So I can't stress if you are somebody who really struggles with anxiety a lot, any way you can become disciplined in a daily practice is really good. And another type of practice that has been shown to be very effective with anxious mind states is loving kindness practice. And if you have not uh, really explored loving kindness practice, you know, one of the ways you can do so is on Insight Timer. I'm sure lots of people have a loving kindness practice. I have a loving kindness practice on there that you can do as a guided practice. 
and this is very useful. I would highly recommend in the morning if you wake up and you know that the anxiety often arises in the mind quickly, start your day off with loving kindness practice. Lay in the bed before your feet hit the ground and do five minutes. Put your hands on your heart as you lie there. Put a hand on your belly and engage in some loving kindness practice for yourself and for the world and for anyone else that you would like to. But this changes the mind. Remember that neurological tenet of what fires together, wires together. Another way of saying that is every thought conditions the next thought. So when we don't attend to our anxiety, not push it away, not hate it, not get mad at it, not criticize ourselves, but actually turn toward it with loving awareness, accept that it's already here and be with it. When we do that, that's a whole different thought process that leads to the next thought process. This is how it works. It's not magic. It's science, and it's got pretty good results right now. And the last thing I, I want to say um, is I just want to make a comment just because I've had a lot of people talk to me about this, about med medication. And the one thing that I never really want to engage in is um, is a discussion where medication and meditation are pitted against each other. I don't see that that's useful. And how we tend to our body, to our health, is so personal for each of us. And for some people, it's medication and meditation that help bring the most balance, the most peace in our minds, which then becomes our lives. And for other people, it's just meditation. Uh, and living mindfully. And for others, it might be medication and not any mindfulness. So, you know, one of the things about mindfulness is we have to remember is that it's being aware without judgment. You know, each of us humans are trying to figure it out. And when we have uh, compassion for ourselves and we have some flexibility, I think we make our best choices. So I just wanted to put that out there because often people will ask me about that as if it's somehow bad to be on a medication. And I, I really try to dispel that. We're not pitting anything against each other. So with that, I will um, stop and let's just sit for just a minute, just to quiet, and then we'll have about five minutes for questions. So.